Life happens fast. And in an instant, disaster could strike. When the choices you make mean the difference between life and death, what would you do? Put yourself to the test and see if you have what it takes to stay alive. Would you do or die? Tornadoes, among the deadliest forces in nature. These proven killers have been recorded on every continent but Antarctica and in every one of the United States. Late spring in the Midwest, twister season. Out of towner Tim Baker is driving through Northeast Missouri when the weather takes a nasty turn. As he heads into Kirksville, a town with a population of nearly 20,000, Tim sees why. Wow, here comes the tornado. Power lines explode as an angry gray funnel grinds toward Main Street. Tim hurries through the streets, hoping to escape. But he makes a critical wrong turn onto a dead-end road. The churning tornado is right on top of him. I'm sorry. Now, put yourself in the path of this devastating twister. It's bearing down, and you only have seconds before it strikes. Would you know how to weather this killer storm? Yeah. Yeah. What would you do? A, take cover under a bridge or overpass. B, get out of the car and lie flat on the ground. Or C, roll down the car windows and stay put. Here's what you should consider. You're in your car, trapped at a dead end, and facing down one of nature's most destructive forces, the tornado. While scientists still debate exactly how they're created, it's believed that when cold Arctic jet streams slam into moist warm fronts, the collision creates a horizontal vortex that then goes vertical. A tornado is formed. First, around the funnel, the atmospheric pressure drops, sometimes by several pounds per square inch. Enough to suck out windows. Then, there's the rotating column's destructive wind speed, which typically gets faster the higher up the funnel goes. The most powerful tornadoes can be over a mile wide and generate winds nearly two times stronger than a Category 5 hurricane. And right now, you're in the destructive path of enough force to turn your car into scrap. Make your choice. A. B. Or C. So what would you do? If you think you can ride out this storm in the shelter of your car, you might choose to roll down your windows and stay put. Scientists once believed that the pressure differential created during a tornado between the inside and outside of a structure caused houses to explode if you didn't open up the windows. We now know it's not the lower pressure that kills, it's the wind. 
And if you think your car can protect against that, you're dead wrong. All around you, chunks of shredded debris whip through the air at speeds faster than the blades of a blender. Your vehicle offers you little protection, if any at all. So if staying in the car isn't the answer, maybe you should follow some commonly believed advice and take shelter under an overpass or bridge. Unfortunately for you, bridges and overpasses aren't shelters. They're death traps. It's called the Venturi effect, caused when the fast-moving wind is forced in the tight space below the overpass. As the air compresses, it speeds up and can easily reach over 300 miles per hour, strong enough to suck you out and slingshot you over a quarter mile away. But even if you could hang on, all that heavy, broken debris from outside is being funneled right at you. In fact, it's now thought this is one of the worst places you can be, even worse than being out in the open. So what should you do? If you have no way of getting to a reinforced shelter, then get out and get low. First, move away from the car to avoid being crushed if it flips. Then, drop face down and cover your head and neck. While the winds above you are powerful enough to launch a 40,000-pound mobile home, when the wind collides with the earth, surface friction slows it down. And at the point where the air actually meets the ground, there's virtually no wind at all. Lucky for Tim, this tornado was only an EF-1, the weakest on the Fujita scale. But even so, it still packed a punch, with winds between 86 and 110 miles per hour. If you're caught in your car with a funnel bearing down, get out, find shelter if you can, and if not, hit the ground and cover your head. That's what you do if you don't want to die. So you manage to emerge unharmed from a deadly tornado. It's time to take on another powerful force of nature. Whether you've seen surfers shooting across the silver screen or at your local beach, there's a good chance you've at least thought about trying it. But there's one thing every would-be wave rider should know. If you surf, you will wipe out. The question is, when and how hard? For all its beauty, the ocean can be a pretty dangerous place. And it's the exhilaration of riding the line between life and death that attracts surfers like Brett Bircher to seek out the biggest breaks in the world. Today, Brett aims to tackle massive waves off the coast of Australia, known to locals as the right. Regulars say it's one of the most dangerous waves you could ever surf. The secret to the right's fury is a shallow reef that juts up and is followed by a deep abyss directly behind it. When the swell hits, the full volume has nowhere to go but up. And Brett's about to take on all that raw power. As the wave builds behind him, Brett begins to pick up speed. When suddenly, he slips. Then, 
he disappears into the white water. Fate unknown. This is where you come in. You're about to experience Brett's wild wipeout. Hold your breath and see if your instincts would keep you alive. What would you do? A, face the shore and swim with the wave. B, once you're under, swim toward the light. Or C, take a breath and stay limber. Here's what you should consider. You've just fallen off your board, traveling over 20 miles per hour, and are about to be crushed by one of the most dangerous waves in the world. The waves here are never smaller than 12 feet. And look out, because any time a massive wave like this rolls in, there's a good chance another is right behind it. These breaking waves can hit with over three tons of force. Experts estimate if we were to harness the power of ocean waves like these, they could produce as much energy as 116 nuclear power plants. But all that power can also push a surfer down so deep they can't tell which way is up. There are multiple ways to die, but only one option will keep you alive. Make your choice. A. B. Or C. So what would you do? If you think you can take advantage of the wave's power, you could try to use its momentum and swim for shore. First, you'd have to get into a swimming position. But even Olympic swimmers generate less than 80 pounds of force with each stroke. That's just a fraction of the force in a wave like this. But even if you could manage to get into a swim position, you leave yourself vulnerable to getting slammed into the razor-sharp reef. This heavy wave has enough force to shatter bone on impact. Try to go with this flow, and you're in over your head. If you are lucky enough to clear the reef, then you better be ready for a deep dive. A wave this size can easily push you 50 feet under in seconds. So you might try to fight your way back to the surface by swimming toward the light. But with the sun's rays refracting through the white water, finding where the light is coming from won't be as simple as looking up. Panicked and disoriented, you could expend valuable energy swimming in the wrong direction. And you need all the energy you can get. Even if you could find your way back to the surface, it may not be over yet. Waves this size can keep you down for more than 30 seconds, long enough for the next wave to come crashing down. So swim toward the light, and things could take a very dark turn. So what should you do? If you want to survive, the best thing to do is take a deep breath and stay relaxed. 
Letting your body go limp will create more surface area, more resistance, and more buoyancy. When you're under, every second will feel like an eternity. But the average person can hold their breath for over a minute. If you're able to keep calm once the wave passes, your full lungs should make you buoyant enough to get out alive. For Brett Bircher, getting slammed by the right left him with a perforated eardrum. But because he took a deep breath and relaxed his body, he'll live to hang 10 again. make the right choice. We're giving you one more chance to test your survival skills. This time, you're going up against a powerful force that every living person on Earth has to contend with. Gravity. It's absolutely essential to our survival. But one wrong move, and it can also lead to your downfall. Gravity. It keeps us anchored to the ground, but it's also responsible for 2.3 million fall-related injuries in the U.S. every year. And you're about to experience one of the most extreme examples. For professional mountain biker Cam Zink, falling comes with the territory. Today, Cam is shredding the craggy canyon trails over Virgin, Utah. But he's about to learn an age-old lesson the hard way. What goes up must come down. It's a brutal crash. But is there anything Cam could have done to make it less devastating? Think hard, because we're taking you back to just after liftoff. Would you be able to minimize the damage from this or any massive fall? What would you do? A, keep your hands on the handlebars and stay with the bike. B, increase the surface area of the impact by using your hands and feet. Or C, bend your knees and brace for impact. Here's what you should consider. You're in mid-flight, soaring over a deep canyon with nothing but solid rock below to break your fall. At takeoff, you're launched 80 feet above the ground, almost three times higher than an Olympic high dive, and without the water to land in. From this height, you'll slam into the canyon rock going nearly 50 miles per hour, approaching an impact force of over 180 tons more than the weight of three humpback whales. You know your options. Make your choice. A. B. Or C. So what would you do? With the ground rapidly approaching, you might think your best bet is to keep your hands on the bars and let the bike's built-in shock absorbers break your fall. But in this crash situation, if you're hanging on to the handlebars, you'd be angled head first toward the ground. If that happens, not even your helmet can save you. The average bike helmet is engineered to withstand an impact of up to 20 miles per hour. 
that's less than half the speed you're traveling. Stay with your bike and you're headed for disaster. So with a hard landing guaranteed, it's time to decide just how to break your fall. You might choose to land on your hands and feet, mimicking cats who have a reputation for landing on all fours. But there's more than just their legs at play. Cats have an extremely flexible spine that allows them to absorb shock while landing. You don't. You have to absorb the impact into your arms and legs, but that could have devastating consequences. Even a fall from just a few feet, like off a skateboard, can generate enough force to break your arms. If, like Cam, you're falling the equivalent of an eight-story building, you better be prepared for a fatal faceplant. So what should you do? Whether you're falling from 80 feet up or off the top rung of a ladder, if you want to increase your odds of walking away, bend your knees and brace for impact. As you hit, you want your body to move like an accordion, letting each of your joints absorb the shock. Make no mistake, it's going to hurt. But if you roll with the momentum, you'll avoid being injured by the sudden hit because Cam loosened up after ditching his bike. The only injuries he suffers are two bruised heels. Stay loose. That's what you do if you don't want to die.